Yes. Her reaction is not surprising because she is a very unassuming person. But what she has done in this country is, is what um, true awards were meant for. And I can say honestly that she is one of my heroes. Mm. Lorna Stanley is a woman who embodies service above self. She was, I won't tell you her age, but she was at a point where she was considering a very peaceful, enjoyable retirement from a very productive life in journalism, etc. Not in education. And she was in a very comfortable place, not too far away from off our shores. And somehow, God got her attention and said, I'm sending you on assignment. And that assignment ended up so far in Trench Down. She came, she saw the conditions of a community, and in particular, young people. She saw injustices, she saw poverty, she saw the very worst of the underbelly of what our nation's inner cities are about, the crime. And she realized that education and lack of opportunity was at the heart of some of the real problems being faced. And she decided to initiate and start a school called Operation Restoration Christian School. And she put it up on the wall, that title, and under it, it talked about restoring a nation. Because she had a vision, and she wanted to impart that vision to a community. So she put it there before them. Lona was the first person I know who started, well, I'm sure there are many people who have done it, but what I call the, the beginnings of the FBTC schools. You know what that is? You haven't heard of that, those schools? It's the fall in between the cracks schools. She saw the students who were the, the worst as it were, those who were rejected by schools as not being possible to be educated. She, she saw kids who had behavioral problems consistently and some school just said, look here, it's not gonna work. You just have to come out. Students who couldn't afford to go to the traditional schools, who were in schools, and she decided she was going to have to reach out to these. And you know some of the stories about her reaching out with teens to educate. Well, she was one of those who didn't just believe in talking. She got into the trenches, literally. Many don't know, but she gave up her homes and she lived down in Trench Town for a while at times when bullets were flying, wars were being fought. Gunmen would challenge, and when she stood up as a member of the community saying these students have to have an education, many of them she had to stand between them and say, well, if you're going to shoot, then you're going to have to kill me. This is a type of woman we're talking about. Not somebody who is highly theoretical and stays afar off and comes with solutions, but she embodies the solutions in her whole life. We, we heard the inspirational talk that spoke of the not yet. I mean, I love that concept. Uh, because so many of us have been through points in our lives where we wish somebody just said to us, not yet, but you're, you're on your way. And instead of branding us failures, well, she dealt predominantly with those who people branded failures. And now I got on nothing good. And she gave them that kind of talk. Don't worry, not yet, but you can. And so she's been practicing some of that. This is what she's been doing and inspiring. And many kids passed through her hands who were not fit for some of these institutions. After they were equipped, they were able to do the grade nine achievement test and get back into the traditional schools and began to make a difference and get into tertiary institutions. It's like God sent out and said, we have the 5,000 to feed, what are we gonna do? And he found Lorna with a, with, a, with a five loaf and two fish. But she didn't just offer it up. She said, can I help to distribute some of the fish and bread? And she's helping to do that now. And we don't know where all of the seeds that she has sown will go. But we know 
that what she has achieved is not just about Lorna Stanley. She pulls people with her because she inspires people to join with her. And that's part of what we're all going to have to do wherever we have the challenges that we face, to pull people with us, to partner, to inspire people. And so she embodies also the fact that it is her God, and she will tell you that is the one that brings her the times when she wants to give up, and the times when she wants to throw in the towel. We've seen her at the best and the worst of times. Mm -hmm. But she always bounces back, and she is what we want to... To, to lift up today, I'm going to ask Professor if you could come and just present this award to her as a woman who is deserving of honor amongst us. Uh, <coughs> Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Stanley. On behalf of Operation Save Jamaica, the School of Education, and indeed this symposium, I am delighted uh, to present you with this uh, symbol of our recognition of your outstanding contribution to education and uh, community development. I really can't see anything, eh? It was then 12 years, and we had a function in Florida, and my brother was there. And I wasn't born here. I was born in Panama. But I came here as a young child. So all of my relatives are in the States. I have no one here. And um, they're all speaking Spanish. I, and I felt very alone because they were very angry. They were very hurt. And on that occasion, when it was then 12 years, I had someone visiting me in, with me in Florida, and we were at a function. And I spoke, and she got up and spoke about the, trans, the transformation in her life and in the lives of the children. And my brother got up, and my brother said, for 12 long years, we have been secretly trying to find a way to get my sister to see a psychiatrist because we are convinced that she has really lost her mind. But this evening, hearing about the achievements that she has made, I have no doubt at all whatsoever that she was called by God to go there. I now, then and now know that this is God that sent me to Trenchtown and has protected me, and to God be the glory. Thank you all. A phenomenal woman. Lorna, thanks for your contribution to this country. And now, sorry, sociologist, and he has studied extensively in the inner city communities. Um, Mr. Horace Levy, he's senior lecturer at, um, in the Faculty of Social Sciences, and he is now retired, but not retired. He still continues his work. And he has written this book, They Cry Respect. I think the book say, the title of the book says it all. And now welcome Mr. Horace Levy. Please join me. Good morning, everybody. The 20 to 30 minute task that I've been given by the organizers of this symposium is to mix of the inner city. Really, it's one dimension of it. Uh, not the whole thing. Uh, and I'm sure, since I see a lot of older heads and fewer younger ones here, that many of you are quite knowledgeable about the inner city, in some cases more so than I. I come to the task not from the side of the school, 
I haven't taught in an inner city school for a long, long time. Um, I come from the side of the Peace Management Initiative, which is an institution that was uh, created some 12 years ago uh, by the then Minister of National Security to head off uh, community violence. And what was unique about it is that it was made up of civilians to do something that normally is put in the hands of the police. Um, so I'm, I'm going to focus not on the school side, that's going to come to you from other people who are better equipped than I am. I'm going to focus on the violence, first of all, secondly on the community, and thirdly on the transition that is taking place. Um, the violence can be approached from many angles, and it's hard to know which one to comment it from, but no doubt from all of them. Um, there's a historical angle, uh, how the violence came about and how it rose to the height of the creation of garrison communities, uh, a perversion of local government, if ever there was one. Uh, there's the present-day defense crews and the police reaction to them. Um, there are, at one end of the spectrum, criminal uh, gangs, and at the other end, uh, everywhere, uh, domestic violence. The criminal gangs, some of them are embedded in some communities. And there are the sources of the violence uh, on the resourcing of the communities, which is the real source. The fact that the state has done so little to, uh, by way of social and economic development. Uh, to touch briefly, first of all, on the historical. Uh, you can move along, please. Um, oh. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. <laughs> no, I haven't reached there yet. Okay, uh, that's it. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, it's important to recognize that low-income urban uh, people are not 1962 would not have been the same uh, as everywhere else, which in fact it was. Um, it was through the lust for power of the two main political parties led by the brown middle class, that the violence was started, sanctioned, and over the years, amplified. Um, very instructive in this regard is Amanda Sive's book, Elections, Violence, and the Democratic Process in Jamaica, 1944 to 2007. It's really worth a read for anybody who is interested in the understanding uh, violence in this country, which is the legacy of the two political parties, uh, the main political parties, the People's National Party and the Jamaica Labour Party to Jamaica. So while they have done a lot of good in Jamaica by way of preserving our democracy, they have done us immense damage by beginning and inculcating violence in our society. Um, it was our political leaders, Bustamante on one side, the JLP, and Isaacs on the other side, who carried the first revolvers, uh, which said fire off if ever they felt uh, threatened. Uh, it was in the 1960s another set of politicians who distributed far more deadly weapons, bought and distributed them, uh, and other uh, instruments of violence like dynamite. Uh, it was these same politicians who built the garrisons, right? Uh, how? By um, uh, only giving uh, units in, in the buildings they set up to members of their own party. In that way, they ensured that they would get re-elected election after election. Um, when the Peace Management Initiative first went into the communities almost 12 years ago, it was PNP community against JLP community that it had to deal with. Within five or six years, the political party polarization started to dwindle. Why? Because the youth came to the view, the realization, an objective realization, that it was unprofitable to shed their blood for some politicians. Well, they might get a, a cell phone uh, if they were lucky, uh, but mostly they got empty promises. <clears throat> and we saw the result of their decision in the December 2011 elections, national election, when uh, it took place with virtually no political violence. 
In fact, partisans of the two parties fraternized openly, sang and danced together in the streets. Uh, that was the first time that had happened in Jamaica for a long, long time. Um, with the, um, I think the next one is appropriate, perhaps. Um, or we're coming to that now. Um, with the turn away of the, the youth and the uh, turn away from violence between opposed sets of communities, politically opposed, the communities were then left, nonetheless, with the same groups armed with the same weapons, right? And they proceeded to turn against one another. Uh, the top of the street from the bottom of the street, this set of housing from that one, within the same communities. Labour Party followers against Labour Party followers. PNP comrades against PNP comrades. So the politics didn't matter in their violence. They still retained their loyalties to the party. Uh, and human life was being taken all the same. Uh, a very sad state of affairs. Uh, because they had guns, they used them, and they committed crimes. Uh, and, you know, in talking about these defense crews, uh, I am by no means trying to defend them. Uh, it is a very sad situation. Um, but one has to realize that it's not something that a lot of youth uh, uh, freely choose. They find themselves born into this box created by the politicians. Uh, and they get swept into it. Uh, by peer pressure. Because while the family uh, is very, very important, community is also very, very important. And when children reach a certain age, parents cease to have as much influence as they used to. And it is the pressure of peers which then begins to weigh heavily on them and to guide them. Uh, but these groups uh, still want better which is why they would come out to meet the Peace Management Initiative uh, representatives when we entered the communities. They would come out to meet us. Criminals don't do that. They want it better. Uh, and hundreds of them, literally hundreds of them, have been turned away from the violence by the work of the Peace Management Initiative, by the work of Children First in Spanish Town, by the work of uh, Grace and Staff in Southside, just to give a few examples of that kind of thing. Their violence is not to be confused with the violence of gangs like the Shower Posse, which deal professionally for the sake of wealth and power in the organized criminality of major robbery, of trading in guns and drugs, uh, in contract killings, in extortion. The difference between defense crews and criminal gangs is considerable, even if the police want to deny it and to lump all in the same bracket. This is why the Jamaica Constabulary Force leadership wants the anti-gang legislation, which is presently on the table in Parliament. They wanted to launch an offensive, not so much against the 15 criminal organizations, the commercial organizations, really, that are the organized crime, as against the rest of the 200 gangs they claim to have identified. Sometimes they say it's 268 or 305. Most recently they say it's 200. But the rest of that 200 are precisely the defense crews I'm talking about. Now there are laws, for example, against conspiracy, which are already in the books for dealing with criminal organizations uh, and could be used against them. Uh, it's not so much for that that the police want the legislation. They wanted to deal with these defense crews, in my view. The main police method you see on that slide is the paramilitary strategy they have been employing for the last 50 years without success, and which by its example of brute force and the anger it provokes contributes actually to worsening the situation. It involves the use of masks in very questionable shootings. It involves police death squads it involves senior police making death threats against our community people. It involves the killing every year for the past seven years of 245 civilians, a good percentage of whom are innocent people, 
innocent youth especially, this strategy has not worked. Right? Take a look at the facts on this chart. This is only for the last 25 or so years. But it shows an inexorable rise in the murder rate, unchecked by the method used by the police. Murders have risen relentlessly. And if one were to carry the chart back to 1962, the year of our, annual, of our national independence, you would find that that year there were 63 murders exactly, as compared to 1095 or 1094 last year. In other words, a movement from one murder every six days to currently three murders every single day, moving at the moment towards four a day. Right? The preventive strategy employed by non-governmental entities, NGOs, has worked. But for want of resources, has worked only in limited areas. The strategy is the one which along with community policing that should be put into effect across the island. It's the one which is responsible for the decrease in murders that took place between 2005 and 2009, exhibited in that slide, in four divisions of Kingston a decrease of 42%, for which the Peace Management Initiative claims some credit, along with community policing, along with agencies like Grace and Staff in Southside. Four divisions in the city between the years of 2005 and 2009, which were the peak years in, in murders in Jamaica. In 2009, there were four killings daily some months, there were five a day. Those were peak years because of killings in other parts of the country, St. James, Clarendon. But in Kingston, there was this decline taking place, phenomenally. This brings me to the second main topic that I want to deal with, community. Because one of the things which the alternative offers is a renewal of community, the community renewal program, which was sketched out, begun to be sketched out, three and a half years ago at the request of the former Prime Minister Bruce Golding, sketched out by the Planning Institute, a community renewal program, which has not been put into effect except in one community, um, which is Majesty Gardens. And the historical beginning it in Seaview Gardens and in downtown Kingston, but it hasn't actually started to any effect, to any extent. Now, I can't emphasize sufficiently the importance of community and the importance of community in the inner city. Right? Uh, community, and I'm, I mean beyond the family, uh, sorry, go back, um, is deep in our beings as humans. Right? It's how we develop our potential right? beyond the family. Uh, it's not up to us to choose community. We can only choose which community or which communities we want to belong to. But we all have to belong to some community, right? as adults anyway, uh, the choice. Uh, in the inner city, geographic community is much more important than in the outer city. In the outer city, people are more mobile. They have interests outside of the areas where they reside. And they move to those interests and uh, belong to such communities. The parallel interest groups inside the inner city are what we would call corner crews. Right? Groups that form to play football, run beach parties, organize church events and pray, gamble, defend the community with guns, the defense crews I was talking about earlier, or just chat up everybody's business. Inner city life is vibrant. People enjoy it. In spite of the poverty and the depressed conditions, they enjoy it. 
Of course, the older ones especially move out if they can because of the poverty and the violence. But they come back. They come back to go to church. They come back to go to funerals. And that's how they socialize with the people in, in the city who are their relatives and friends. I have a helper who now has a home near to Old Harbor, but she spends half the time in the inner city still. She can't tear away from it, right? And she's back there every other week to a funeral. Um, in inner city communities of two, three, four thousand people, everyone is known to everybody else. As so-and-so's aunt, nephew, brother, girlfriend, what have you. Family linkages, linkages thread the area. In that respect, inner city communities are very traditional. They're almost rural rather than urban in the modern sense of an urban community. The big difference is that because of the wars, when generals tend to take over, it's the youth that tend to run things. And the older heads, the justices of the peace and the pastors and so on, have been forced into back seats very often. So the culture of the inner city is different from everywhere else. Different from the rural, different from the outer city. To a large extent because of the social exclusion to which they have been, into which they have been forced. So they develop their own life and life is loud, it's raw, it's crowding to sport uh, encounters uh, and to musical events. It's very creative in part because of the very lawlessness which gives them a greater freedom uh, and they use it in that way, right? It craves, it's assertive and yet it craves respect. It goes through long bouts of unemployment, very patiently. Its males are guilty of the worst kind of masochism, machismo rather, <laughs> masochism. Uh, and its young girls are also very aggressive. Why? In order to ward off the aggressiveness of the males. They have to be constantly defending themselves. It's into this very complex scene. Uh, it's from this very complex scene that students enter the classrooms and which teachers are called upon to deal with. Uh, and deal with and to understand sympathetically. It's especially the case because on the family side, there are so many domestic conflicts. And conflicts are frequent in the inner city because of the crowding in the homes, the limited resources, the struggle for survival, all of them combined with the multiple sexual relations entered into by both males and females. For these reasons, and because of the migration very often of parents away from their families, and the absence of strong collective uh, community responsibility. Lower income urban families have suffered serious degradation over the past couple of years. And this impacts very heavily on the schools, right? This throws a huge burden on teachers and on schools. Beyond the teaching, teachers have to be counselors mentors to the children, giving them constant attention and a great deal of love and guidance. With the economy what it is, many are in survival mode, not only aggressive, but hungry, uh, and making it doubly difficult for teachers to treat them like the adults that they want to be treated like, and given the respect that is their due and that they want very much and need more than anything else. Beyond these descriptions of the tapestry of inner city life, which, on which one could go on at length, there is the analytic point that I want to emphasize that the Peace Management Initiative has insisted on for years now. And it is that the problems that we face there are not so much gang problems as community problems community problems in the sense that the community is the matrix 
and if the community were dealt with properly, then a lot of the problems with gangs and crews would melt away, a lot of them. Right? Defense crews and even many criminal gangs are the product, as the slide says, of an interaction between the political leaders and community people. It's a product. Philosophers among you would say it's a dialectical process in the sense that the product ricochets back on each of the components and that further affects the, the, first, the further results. The political parties no longer interact uh, with communities in the form of distributing weapons. They do it through the contracts that they give to individuals and groups. Many of these interactions are positive and in no way result in no violent uh, or, vi or criminal action. Members of parliament have their constituency development funds and use it positively. But they also use it, it's also a negative thing, the community development fund, because it undermines local government efforts. That's another story which I can't develop here. But, but the contracts are relevant. They're the very ones that went on for years. For example, the Christopher Cook's uh, incomparable uh, community, uh, uh, company, contracts given to him by both political parties over many years. Right? Uh, and they have gone, these contracts, to defense crews as well. This brings me, lastly, to the third element, the transition process that the inner city is going through. The inner city is not static. I already indicated, for example, the shift from communities polarized politically to groups uh, within communities uh, fighting each other uh, in defense of one section against another section. And they do it for the sake of finding their own identity. It's not as stupid as it looks. Right? The movement, the transition is slow and uncertain, just as it is nationally. Very uncertain. We don't know. We're not sure if this country is going to collapse or not. Uh, I used to think it was inevitable that we would not collapse until I read a book by uh, Jared Diamond, <coughs> uh, Steel, Germs, and Guns, and another one called Collapse, <coughs> and realized, <coughs> excuse me, historically, how countries do collapse and fall apart. Uh, thank you. I got you. <laughs> She's giving me a time signal. Um, but there's movement, nonetheless. Uh, and it's happening in the inner city. And the schools have a role to play in it, short term and long term. And it's important to understand the nature of the transition. The removal of Christopher Dudas Cook from Tivoli Gardens three and a half years ago almost shook up the garrisons. One you said to me uh, when we were doing our research there last year, uh, garrison dead now. Well, not quite dead, but it's, it was badly shaken up. Murders dropped from four and five a day the previous year to three a day. And it has stayed flat at three a day until the last couple of months when it started to edge up again. The drop in shooting was instantaneous, right? Overnight, um, the sense of impunity that the state's years of failure to deal with Tivoli Gardens had created, that sense of impunity evaporated. Fewer bullets and guns came through, came through. Community people oppressed by the violence felt freer to communicate with the police. Police uh, uh, stopped so openly parking their cars outside the headquarters of, of criminal dons. Successive governments failed, however, to take advantage of that opportunity, to walk through that open door uh, that occurred right then, right? Uh, to help the communities that were literally gasping for assistance, and that still are, right? They missed a glorious opportunity. And the result in a section of West Kingston 
is that the situation is almost worse than it was before, if not worse, right? Uh, and we've seen some of it, the number of murders, the, the gang fighting between the four or five gangs, the three or four gangs in the Denham town and Antivoli area, right? Um, elsewhere, it's business as usual. There's a bit of an opening to the positive still, a waiting with patience, but also there's a quiet turning back from other to the old ways. The violence is beginning to pick back up again, right? Um, and why? Because the security action that took place in May 2010, while entirely necessary, right, entirely necessary, um, got out of hand. It ballooned into a, a massacre. The public defender identified of that 76 or 80 murders, that killings that took place, that maybe 44 of them were extra, uh, extra judicial. 44, right? Uh, this was taken by the police as a signal to carry on like that, right? And the policing that followed, right, uh, has been similar. Just a few days ago, last week, youth were being scraped up by the score in Denham Town, Hannah Town, herded into community centers. Community centers were being turned into detention centers, right? Uh, very similar to what happened after May 2010 when 800 plus youth were herded into the national arena, right? Under very dire conditions, right? This is not succeeding, as I've indicated before, in checking the murder rate. Some gangs are going on the ground. Older gang leaders are stepping back to escape being taken in by the police, right? And the younger ones don't want to talk peace, right? They're more aggressive. Um, they're not going in for the lengthy exchanges of gunfire that used to take place. This is another transition that's taking place. They're targeting individuals individually. And the work of the Peace Management Initiative has to follow suit uh, because we track these changes. So we know by knowing virtually everybody inside the inner city who to go to in order to try to minimize the violence. And then there is a national context for all of this. Very important. Earlier this week, the Minister of National Security on the radio acknowledged the distinction made in a parliamentary presentation by Jamaicans for Justice and the Jamaica Civil Society Coalition. He acknowledged the difference between defense crews and criminal gangs. That was a major, major step. Major because that was one of the major points being made in that presentation, right? I wait to see, I wait to see whether he's gonna persuade certain police to accept that. There are police, community police, who do accept it, but there are others who don't, right? Will it signify that the Ministry of National Security will begin to make more widely the race class shift that the Ministry of Education is making. The Ministry of Education is pushing hard on many fronts, from infant schools through primary and secondary, to ensure that lower income black children receive from the state an educational offering equal to the one received by lighter skinned middle and upper class children. The Ministry of National Security is called on to see to it that black inner city youth get treatment from police no different from what is given to middle and upper class children in Upper St. Andrew. Present paramilitary policing, the killing of that youth in Mountain View just a couple of days ago, is not doing that. People don't like to hear this accusation of racism and classism. No one, not even a race, a race likes to be called that. And the charge which I made in a letter to the Gleaner a couple of weeks ago and make again here is not to say you are a racist or you are a racist, it's not. It's to say that it's deep in the structure of our society, coming down from the days of slavery, right? It's embedded in it. The efforts of the Ministry of Education show it. 
the objection to the use of our of patro of our Jamaican language, show it. The bleaching, show it. And as somebody was pointing out to me, a teacher in the break, the better treatment of brown children in classes in the inner city by teachers demonstrated. Right? Um, the advertisements that you see on the radio and the television all the time, which show a black man courting a brown woman, demonstrated. You know, the media, the advertisers really need to change that. It's a very, very bad ad. It's prevalent, and it really needs to be changed. And I really want to call on them to change it. Society is not as racist as it was in the 1960s, when you couldn't find a black face in a bank unless it was pushing a broom and sweeping the floor. But it's still here. The issue has other dimensions. The salary increase to judges which were running into difficulty just a few days ago. We're not forthcoming. But let me point out to you that assistant commissioners of police receive a salary that together with housing and duty allowance ranges from seven to eight million dollars a year. Many people don't know this. They are very well paid. And there are 18 assistant commissioners of police. And above them, there are four deputy commissioners of police and, of course, the commissioner himself. And you can guess what they earn. The underlying fact is that you should take note of is that the annual budget allocation to the Ministry of Justice, which has a huge backlog of cases, creating a massive sense of impunity among would-be murderers, is approximately 4.5 billion. Compare that with what goes to the Ministry of National Security. It is 45 billion, 10 times. Obviously, that budget has to be larger. They have to pay the police, 11,000, the army, and they have to look after the prisons. But even so, a better balance can be struck. And preventive measures, as Dr. Elizabeth Ward is fond of saying, are much cheaper than prosecuting criminals and locking them up. There's a good deal more that could be said about community dynamics from the side that I've been addressing it. Hopefully, these will be helpful. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Mr. Horace Levy. The session still continues with Mr. Horace, and I'm going to call Ms. Karen Tweets to organize us. And then Mr. Horace Levy, really, 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 really <laughs> very interesting and informative. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be breaking into four groups. Um, Mrs. Ingrid Anderson is coming around with some little slips of paper that, again, you have moderators that will tell you what we're going to talk about. Okay, certainly. Number one is going to be dealing with, um, a which one is it again? Okay, well, let me get the piece of paper and I'll come back and tell you. So all the ones there, twos, threes, and fours. One, what can the school do to build social capital? which is the community one, number one, right? Um, and then the uh, number two, uh, one is culture. I don't remember if it's that two or four. Uh, what can the school do? There are positive elements in, this, in the culture, very creative elements, and there are negative. Culture is not cast in stone. It can change. Certain things in inner city have grown up over the years. They can be dissolved. Uh, and the other one is the violence, number four. What can the school do uh, to, to control, to, to, to help youth, to talk? Um, how can I put it? 
have a more creative slant. That caused quite a bit of debate because for many of us, we are expected to teach a curriculum and come to you know, a standardized test at some point. So there was a big debate about that. We also spoke about limited role models. Could it be that our students only see certain people in their environment and so that's who they want to emulate? Unfortunately, academics, for a lot of, a lot of them, academics are not people they see. And we also spoke about you know, some of the challenges that teachers face in handling some of the special needs and conduct disorders and attention issues that many of our kids seem to have. Um, so, you know, how do we use the culture that the children come with to enhance their learning and not have it negatively impacted? Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, group three looked at the business of uh, social exclusion uh, in terms of both uh, classism, racism, how is that defined? Um, I think we came up with the main point being that you are brown or you are black, you know, you can be treated a particular way because of how you are perceived, whether you have money or no money. Um, it, it influences how people will treat you. And from children are little, you know, they're, they're treated as being black or brown. Brown is pretty, black is not so pretty, and all of those kind of ideas came up forward. But I think we, we stopped at the discussion of how the ministry in particular promotes exclusion in our schools um, via its policies, et cetera. Um, streaming of children, you know, um, in, in schools because of the whole business of performance um, ratings. Schools are going to exclude the slower ones, uh, hide them, per se and we, we get the bright ones to perform well, you know, so our school can get a good rating. How do we place um, students at a campion versus a Donald Quarry, you know, that, that whole policy making business, how do we go about that? And how is that now being reflected in this business of exclusion? So it was a very lively discussion and I don't think we came to a conclusion really, but this exclusion thing, you know, it, it's really ingrained and needs to be addressed urgently. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my group looked at aggression and violence in schools, and in school, much less to put on paper what are all the forms of um, resolve that we could initiate to help to reduce aggression and violence in school. Um, most of the schools that were there, represented there, were high schools, secondary schools. And one of the main issues that we spoke about was the intolerance, the general attitude of students towards each other in these schools, whether it's expressed as verbal or physical intolerance. The children seem to have, a, it's ignited mainly by that sense of being better than the other person. Um, a sense of, um, you know, I have more money than you or I have more material goods than you. A sense of there are the gender issues and there are the class issues, as we all know. And we looked at the reasons for a lot of the violence and aggression that takes place. And some of the main things we came up with was that teachers said, well, you know, the, the parenting is really lacking. Quality parenting is limited. Um, the parents themselves are bad influences on the children because of the community that they come from. And they themselves lack parenting and the influences that they're, they're exposed to within their own community. The unemployment rate, most, a lot of them don't have anything to do. So they stay home and they get involved with the drug dons and they begin to take the drugs themselves and the children come home and they're exposed to that. And just the whole 
culture, the, the style, the social style in which they are brought up is aggressive. So that impacts on the child and it transcends into the school itself. The infrastructure, where the boundaries, one um, gentleman, Mr. Donaldson from Kingston Technical, gave us a good example of how his school is bounded on one side by Rum Lane. And when the, ch when the children throw the litter through the windows, um, it drops onto the lane itself. And this, this small act of, from children initiates a big war on the street, the community beyond the wall. And so he himself has to become the peacemaker, the conflict manager. He has to speak to the child and try to stop the behavior, but he also has to connect with the community and assure them that he's doing something, but out of it comes some good because in fact, the community tends to respond when we make that sort of connection with them. They respond positively by helping his case. They turn around and they will now point out to him what else he needs to do in his school and who else is misbehaving. So, you know, that, that, that is a hopeful sort of initiative. Um, the next thing we looked at was that the society in itself has problems. There's the Gaza and the Gully gang war, all of that culture that comes from music. So music, you know, is something that the society itself needs to take into consideration how it impacts our children. Now, some of the, um, we also looked at the, the problem of parenting whereby there are many children who don't really have parents. And one teacher said 50%, almost 50% of students have no parent or guardians. So, and then there is the, the children in the system who are undiagnosed. There was a special ed teacher and she said, you know, there are a lot of children in the system who are already predisposed to disorders and they, they tend to have more aggression and violence um, and they're probably more impressionable from what they gain in their community, whatever they see happening in their home and community, they're more impressionable because they have a learning disorder, behavioral disorder. And so that also has to be taken into consideration. And what she enlightened us with was that we need to maybe um, put in place what she called replacement behaviors, modeling being better models and modeling the type of symbolism of good behavior that we want our children to adapt or adopt, adapt or adopt, adapt to or adopt from us, from our own behavior. And finally, <laughs> I know you're rushing me. We, we had a very lively and involved discussion. We, in the um, final analysis, um, we, we spoke about this concept of dominance as something um, that needs to be taken into control, under control in our school system. And so we need to re-inculcate a culture and set the example. And the onus is on the teachers um, to be better role models and to reduce that sense of that air of dominance by just reaching out, showing respect. And one teacher made a very important point. She said, we need to pay attention to our children in the system, those who are being abused in particular. Thank you. Trying to pull together such a complex picture. <laughs> uh, I've identified so far two themes, but there may be others. Um, one is 
the need for the school. Because remember, the, and the first theme is that, and it's illustrated by the example given by Mr. Donaldson from Kingston Technical, uh, which was cited by the last speaker, that the school needs to go to the community. This is what he, he did. Because his boys were throwing garbage through the windows, he not only spoke to them, but he went to the community. And they welcomed him. Uh, and so on, and accepted, and, and so a, a rapport was set up, a relationship was set up. That's crucial, right? And it's also illustrated in the, in the second group, in the culture one, that the school needs to go to the creativity that's in the community, to use that, to draw that into the school work, to build on it. Uh, right, Karen? Isn't that the idea? Uh, if I'm not misinterpreting you. Right, so that's one theme that the, the school needs to to build on the community that way, to go to it, to involve it, right, uh, to draw on it. It's also in the one, the first theme about the, uh, the 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 community side that it's got to get the involvement of the community. It's got to get the PTAs involved, right. Uh, uh, um, and that comes up also, it came up in the exclusion one, uh, in a different way. Uh, it came up in the respect that the ministry is doing certain things which are causing exclusion. Am I right, Lloyd? The ministry is, doing, I listened in a little bit on that one. The ministry, by setting as the criterion the criterion, the academic achievement, and using that as sort of only the only criterion is then causing exclusion of children who don't come up to that. The schools bend over backward, they do double takes to, to, to hide the fact that some of their students are not up to the level and so on. I hope I'm not misinterpreting <laughs> what they're saying, uh, but I think that came out very heavily from that, uh, that uh, no? All right, I'll come to you in a second. You can contradict me. <laughs> um, but others, well, no, you were saying that, I thought. Um, that was one theme. Um, but no, that links into the second theme, it seemed to me, which is that parents, uh, so that on the one hand, the, the school has to go to the, the community. On the other hand, the parents need to come forward. Parents need to be speaking out more. Uh, um, they need to be more involved. Um, if the school is doing something wrong, or if the ministry is doing something wrong, parents need to step forward uh, and not be so submissive to it. Uh, I, I don't know, I got that I image from that idea, again from the uh, social exclusion group. Um, um, and and uh, maybe the third one, theme is the last one that the last speaker ended up on, that, which runs through the others, that we, there's too much dominance around, and that the only way to deal with it is by countering it with respect. If you give respect to the students, if you give respect to the parents, um, if there is a whole attitude uh, like that, then the intolerance of violence uh, will be will melt away, and I know <clears throat> that this is something that particularly is important for the police. You see, the police uh, find it very difficult to treat the community as its equal, as its partner. Not the community, not the, the community police side, the community relations officers. They they know that, but the, the ones who come in and scrape up the youth, or come in and just kill, they they can't. They can't. They want to be on top. They want to rule the scene. They want to dominate the scene. And what is needed instead is a more service-oriented approach, a more equal approach. So those are the three things. The school needs to go to the community. The community needs to talk up. Parents need to be more involved. And there needs to be more a culture of respect. I don't know if that makes sense. What do you think?
Thank you so much, Mr. Horace Levy. That was really very interesting and very informative. Could you? Okay. Um, we are running a little behind time again. So we're going to have lunch now. And I may cut you now, go outside and enjoy the delicious meal and drinks that is waiting for you, please. Oh.